one of the reasons why I still view rapamycin as, as, as you know, the gold standard of, of longevity interventions, at least pharmacological longevity interventions, is that we know that um, rapamycin itself can increase lifespan in every animal model or cell, cellular model where it's been tested, yeast, worms, flies, mice, rapamycin increases lifespan. We know that the, that the genetic correlate of that, so genetically turning down mTOR complex one, also increases lifespan in all of those model systems. So you've got the drug, you've got the genetics lining up. Um, and it's by far the most robust and reproducible pharmacological intervention for increasing lifespan in mice. So unlike things like nicotinamide riboside, um, where you know one person reports it extends lifespan, another group can't reproduce it. Same thing with sirtuin activators. Um, everybody gets rapamycin to extend lifespan, and it's usually not small effects. So you know, some I think the lowest effect is nine percent that's been reported, and the highest is around thirty percent. And it you know usually in that twenty percent range, which is kind of my cutoff for something I really feel comfortable about when somebody publishes a paper in mice. If it's less than twenty percent. I'm sort of like, I don't know, let's wait and see if somebody else can reproduce it first. Uh, but rapamycin has been reproduced, many different labs, multiple strain backgrounds. So it really seems robust. Now, you know, we talked earlier about the genetic variation in the response to caloric restriction. I do think, you know, we have to be honest, rapamycin hasn't been tested in nearly as many genetic backgrounds as caloric restriction. So it's been shown to extend lifespan in, you know, I think four different genetic backgrounds now. But well, we don't know whether it's going to work the same way across. If we were to look at 20 different genetic backgrounds, would it work in all of them and some of them? We don't know the answer to that yet. So that's an, that's an important outstanding question. But I would say it is, it is definitely the most robust and reproducible pharmacological um, method for extending lifespan in mice. And it's not only lifespan, but in pretty much every organ or tissue where you look, you can find evidence that rapamycin is either delaying the declines in function, or I think what's most exciting, actually reversing functional declines associated with aging. And we talked about functional measures of aging. And I think if you can reverse, if you can take an old mouse where function is not very good, treat it for eight, eight weeks with a drug and make function better, that's exactly what we want, right? And we know that's true for rapamycin, at least in immune, brain, heart, and oral cavity. You see reversal of aging uh, functional declines in about six to eight weeks of treatment. So it's pretty exciting. That is really exciting. I have to say, as I was doing research for this and looking up your work in rapamycin, it got me extremely excited about it. I was telling my friends, I'm like, oh, this, this is the other thing I, I want to study <laughs> more of. Um, so when it comes to health span benefits, you mentioned it reverses the functional decline as well. Is that something, um, as in like you've seen it for older mice, uh, does it work in younger mice too? Is there sort of like an age because uh, I, I guess you probably don't want to inhibit mTOR when you're younger, right? So I think we don't really know. I mean, I think definitely when you're talking about development, right, you probably don't want to significantly in inhibit mTOR. The expectation would be if you did, you would get slower development and probably smaller adult body size. Now, you know, that actually smaller adult body size in and of itself in the long run may have beneficial effects for health and longevity. But, but I, I certainly would not suggest that, you know, that we should be thinking about treating teenagers or, or kids with rapamycin, right? I mean, I think that's off the table, um, at least for aging. There are certain diseases where it might make sense, but, but not for aging. Um, so, so, but I will say there, is, there are a couple of interesting studies that have suggested that in, even in young mice, for some of the parameters where rapamycin uh, seems to benefit old mice, you see the same sort of trends in, in young mice. Uh, so, you know, improvements or changes in function going in the same direction, even in mm -hmm. young mice. It's interesting because, you know, there's at least one paper that has, has argued that that suggests that rapamycin may not be affecting aging, right? If you're seeing the same effects in young mice as in old mice, you know, maybe it's not really affecting aging. And I, I understand the logic of that argument. I think what that argument misses is that rapamycin isn't only affecting one thing, right? It's affecting, broadly speaking, every aspect of aging that, that we can measure. So while it might be the case that there are changes, or I, I hesitate to say improvements because you're talking about a young animal that's already functioning pretty well, changes in function in young animals that look that are in the same direction as the changes in function in old animals, at least maybe in heart, for example. Um, I don't think that's an argument that rapamycin isn't affecting aging, it just means that rapamycin has effects in young animals as well. Um, 
so but 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 to get back to your earlier point one of the i think one of the really exciting things about rapamycin from a translational perspective is that you don't have to start in young age, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, the, the first study to show that I think was the, the 2009 study from the intervention testing program, uh, where they started treating mice at 20 months of age with rapamycin, and they saw they could get a significant lifespan benefit. That was really the first convincing study that you could treat with a drug in middle age and get significant effects on lifespan. I think before that time, myself included, almost everybody in the field would have said, you know, you probably have to start when you're young because what these things are doing are just slowing the decline, right? I think what that study did is it really changed the way we think about intervention and aging. And now we have, you know, many, many more studies since then that have shown that, yeah, in fact, you can take an old mouse and actually make things better, right? And that that's a real, it's a real conceptual shift, I think, in the way the field has, is approaching aging. And, and from a translational perspective, it's really important, right? Because it's much easier to envision an intervention that you can start treating people in their 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s and get a benefit than something you would have to start treating people when they're 18, right? Um, that's not realistic at, at this point. So, so I think that's been a really important change in the way that we, we think about the biology of aging. And largely that can be traced back to that study with rapamycin in 2009.